Welcome to Automotive Tech Talk, our podcast. I'm John Gardner. I host a couple television shows, Tech Garage and Motorhead Garage, on MAV TV, Revit TV, and Motor Trend Television. I'm also an ASE Master Certified Technician and an automotive technology instructor for over 20 years. So pretty much a subject matter expert. Can we fix every car? No, we say that all the time. Do we know where to find the information? Yeah, and hopefully we'll give you some here. I am here with my trusty sidekick, Josh Ellis, who is also a master certified ASE technician and an instructor at Chipola College Automotive Technology Department as well, teaching those guys, giving them knowledge, Mr. Ellis. That's right, doing some investment. Today, what should we talk about today? Man, today it's all about that strategy-based diagnosing, diagnosing your car, okay? We get so many emails and we love the emails. Keep them coming. The comments below, keep them coming, okay? We're gonna pick out from them and you're gonna hear them on the show. But more importantly, we took just a whole bunch of them and we said, hey, how can we help these folks out? Listen in, how can we actually get you out there and diagnose a car? We call it strategy-based diagnosing in the industry. This is actually, General Motors uses this as a technicians and as they use it as technicians use it, you guys can do it right there at home. It's kind of a diagnostic thought process, if you will, on how to fix your car. And, and Josh, just start out. How do you take tires off? Do you take the lug nuts off and chuck them across the shop? I do not. No, I try to keep them close by and put them somewhere in some sort of systematic order so I can get to them quickly if I need to, when, when the job is done. Why? Because time is money. Time is money. Time is money. <laughs> That's how it is in our industry. Time is money. But basically, to fix anything, we have to use this crazy thought process. I mean, you do it. Uh, what do you do when you get gas in your car? The same thing? Do you pull up to the pump backwards, or do you know how to do it? Well, first, I have to make sure I'm on the have the gas on the right side. The the doors on the right side. I have to be pulling around, lose my spot, and have to start all over again. So you have a strategic approach to do it. I do. I have to know exactly what side that door's on and pull up just far so I don't have to get out, back up, and I have to know what what grade of gas I'm getting and all that kind of stuff. And let's go through a kind of a flow chart, but, you know, our listeners, they can't see it, but they can hear it. You know, first thing you have to do is verify your concern. And, you know, what's your concern? I mean, it could be as simple as some tire noise. You know, there's some strategies you can do. You can change road surfaces, see if the noise changes. You may have a rattle. You may have a misfire. There's power balance tests. There's so many different things you can do. But to isolate that, I just want to stick with a couple of the basics. We have with that verify the customer's concern. And, and there's a couple of things you have to be aware of with your vehicle when you're kind of diagnosing it. And, and one of them is right here. What are the aftermarket models or options with your car? What does that matter? Well, one thing is some of these aftermarket components, if there's a lot really available, it's probably something that's common on your vehicle for one. Right, right, absolutely. We'll get into that in a little while called TSB, Technical Service Bulletins, but you know, pretty cool story. We used to live in South Florida and there was a neighborhood <laughs> called Leisureville and all the houses were the same and all the cars were the same. Everybody had Illumina. And when they had Illumina, they would all have a stick in the little turn signal there, you know, that does the cruise control. Mm -hmm. Well, every Lumina came with it, but some had cruise control and some didn't. So of course, Betty would ride down to the supermarket with her friend and push the button. She's like, oh, cool. Check this out. I took my foot off the gas and I'm cruising around in cruise control. And guess what? Bam. So does Martha. Push it, nothing. Push it, nothing. Brings it into the shop. What's going on? Simple strategy-based diagnosis. What options does it have? What does it have? How does it work? I mean, especially today's cars, man. Where's the best place to go find what's my model options and what's going on? I mean, you got all this ginormous technology in these vehicles. I don't even know how it works. Well, what you can do is you can go to your dealer or you can go online. Some, some things are online where you can punch in your VIN number and it tells you exactly everything that came from the factory for your vehicle. And that makes a big difference. I mean, we had the heads up display come up there and it was when the Denali first come out. I can remember it at the shop and we would start to roll and when we would stop, some of the keyboard would go away and then we would start to move and bam, we'd come to a stop and the keyboard would come back and then we'd move and we're jiggling wires, beating wire harnesses, the whole nine yards, get on the phone with technical assist. Hey, help us out. Half the keyboard's going away. We put a whole new infotainment system in it, a whole new wire harness, just kept happening over and over again. This is new technology. Come to find out, 
when you start moving, it took some letters away, so you couldn't type in. Yeah. <laughs> do your no do your navigation, no yeah. texting on no, the not screen. Not while you're driving on the screen. Who would have known it? So yeah, so there's a lot of things that are going on. Here's another one. What aftermarket? Ooh, gosh. If I had a red flag, I would throw up a red flag right here. I mean, not bashing the aftermarket in no way, shape, or form. They do great work, but that's just one of those red flags you have to look at. Perhaps you took your car in and you just got a bunch of aftermarket work done to it, some aftermarket options installed, and now all of a sudden you're wipers or your car's misfiring could that cause it absolutely absolutely you hook up a wire you put a new motor in there uh, for your transmission on your wiring on uh, something's wired wrong shorten out <laughs> i mean we have an experience putting in an aftermarket fuel pump don't yeah. we on, yep. a, on an infinity and it totally wouldn't even let the car start it was shorting out inside the tank it was. It was a different resistance value, and the key wouldn't even see it. These cars are crazy today, man. Technologically sophisticated. That's right. Here's some big words for you. Yeah, definitely throw up that red flag. You go, go. your brake lights aren't working. Maybe it just had a trailer hitch or something going on with some of the wiring up under there. Some of your headlights aren't working. Look at the bulbs. Maybe they've been changed. Um, any kind of major repairs, just look back at the last repair and kind of determine whether you did it yourself or not. Maybe that's one of the problems, okay? Here's one of the best ones. I love this strategy-based diagnosis because it can help out people a lot, especially when it comes to what related systems are operating properly. Boy, we can get into schematics, we can get into all this crazy stuff, but it makes a huge difference what's operating properly. For example, Josh, what if I, what if I had one mirror working and the other mirror is not working? The driver's is working and the passenger's not working. What does that tell you? Well, it tells you first and foremost that you don't need to check the mirror fuse. Right. Because all the power for those mirrors is going to go through that fuse and go to your driver's side mirror and then to your passenger side mirror. In most, in most cases, all the power even going to your passenger side mirror go through even the driver's side switch for that mirror. Exactly. So, yeah, a lot of times, you know, if I got the passenger window working and the driver's not, you have to pull up a schematic. That's a whole mm -hmm. other show. I mean, that's crazy. But, you know, you have to understand the system you're working on, understand how it worked, how it's powered, how it's grounded, how it's fused. So, yes, we see that all the time. We'll see someone call in or write in. They'll say, well, my mirror is not working. I put a new fuse in. You know, well, did you try the driver's side? No, try that. Mm -hmm. If that's working, we can basically eliminate a lot, look at a schematic and tell you exactly what's going on with your car with this called strategy-based diagnosis, diagnosing your car. Here's a couple other questions. Where does it occur or when does the problem occur? Let's start with when does it occur? Does that make a difference? Absolutely, it does. If it, if it occurs, I mean, it kind of ties into the where sometimes. If you're going across a bumpy road and all of a sudden now my, my passenger side like you said, mirror is not working when I go across a bumpy road or it jerks around. You could have a loose ground or some connectors loose or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. So when makes a big difference when, you know, 100 miles, 500 miles in the first two minutes or in 30 minutes? Is something getting hot? Is it taking something to get hot? You know, sometimes you run to Walmart, you go into Walmart, you get to the parking lot and all of a sudden your car won't start. That's it. That's it. Well, you go in, you shop, you come out and about an hour later, in our case, two hours, you got like 14 kids. Right? You, you, you come out. And, Minus 10. Yeah. So you come out and I crank it up and it won't, it starts. I mean, what happened? It wouldn't start. It start. Then the tow truck driver comes and gets it and it starts. It wouldn't start for me. It cooled down. Maybe it was amps, maybe something going on, but the component cooled down and then it worked. So when makes a big difference? When? Let me ask you a question, Josh. If I had a brand new car, let's say, for example, the mirror doesn't work. 500 miles, first of all, 500 miles strategy-based diagnosis versus 100,000 miles. So at 500 miles, what are you thinking? And then 100,000 miles, at 500 miles, it never worked. At 100,000, it worked and then it quit. Mm -hmm. There's two whole different thought patterns when it comes to that. That's right. Well, a 500-mile vehicle is a brand new vehicle. And if something hasn't worked from the get-go or just just recently went out and you're only 500 miles in i'm thinking something probably from the factory something didn't get connected right or it's a faulty component to start off with versus a hundred thousand miles where that even the window or the mirror something's been used over and over and over again over a hundred thousand miles there's no telling how many times that switch has been engaged and disengaged and probably got some wear and tear on it yeah you can look at the car i mean you know yeah. coke and and Dorito chips and everything piled up over there on the center console and spilt and coffee and the whole nine yards. 
yeah, it's a good strategy or strategic way to diagnose the car. 500 miles, factory unplugged, something going on, factory defect. 100,000 miles, it may have just burnt out. It's mm -hmm. time for a new one is what it is, okay? Where does it occur? Ooh, big one. Where does it occur? I mean, does it occur on a hill? Does it occur on articulating roads? Does it occur right in the driveway? Does it occur up in when it's snowing? Montana or is it here in Florida or Key West? Does it make a difference on today's cars? Absolutely. I mean, you can be going around a curve. You can be going up a hill, down a hill. That I mean, these electronics are very sensitive and they're all there to optimize your vehicle's road response and your driving experience. Yep. Had a truck one time. The dude says, hey, I can't get it out of park. It's so hard to get out of park. And, and you probably know, so be quiet. It's part of, you know, mm. transmission. So we go over to the dude, put it in the parking lot, comes out tomorrow, start it up, no problem. Come out the next day, start it up, no problem. He takes it, he comes back, says, man, I'm aggravated. I'm really ticked off. This thing will not come out of park in the morning. Okay, leave it here. Give him a rent a car, the whole nine yards. Comes out in the morning, boom, no problem shifting, no problem shifting. Comes back a third time. Finally, the service director says, hey, let's go. Just leave it in your driveway. We'll come over tomorrow morning. We had no idea this cat lived on the beach. And when we went up in his driveway, it was like a 45 degree incline. <laughs> and of course he put it in park, didn't use the e-brake and that parking park <coughs> was down on that yeah. transmission. You had to slam it out of park. So sometimes customer expectations plays a lot in this. I mean, yeah. we get guys come in all the time. They're driving pickup trucks or they trade in a Cadillac. When you tra trade in a Cadillac and you go to a pickup truck, they turn around and go, man, this thing's shifting super hard. I can feel it. Well, that's inherent for the car. That's the way it goes. I mean, the pick, pickup trucks are going to shift harder than Cadillacs just due to the transmission and the configurations in the transmissions. How long does it occur? That's that's important. Man, we tell everybody if it's not broke, don't fix it. Yeah, you can't fix it. It's got to be broke. You guys bring it to the shop. You're like, hey, man, this did this. It did it once. I was on the way to Orlando. That was six hours driving and it had a hiccup. It may never come back. OK, we don't want to replace a bunch of parts that don't need to be replaced and, and guesswork's not going to get it. So if it's not broke, don't fix it. How long? It has to be broke. How long, how often, and how severe is the problem? That's one of the things you can do. Okay. So that gives you some strategy based diagnosing for your car. And then there's a couple other tricks you can do. There's diagnostic worksheets. And if we go down the flow chart, the preliminary checks are looking at it, but Josh, there's these things called bulletin, technical service bulletins. What are those? As we stated earlier, uh, you want to know what vehicle you're working on, and sometimes there's pattern failures. And the technical service bulletin is basically where the dealer has acknowledged, the dealer manufacturer has acknowledged that the issue you're experiencing is indeed an issue. They've put out a, a bulletin on how to fix those issues. Yeah, so it's just little quirks with the vehicle. If you don't want to freak out, don't Google all your TSBs or technical <laughs> service bulletins because all of a sudden there'll be rattles and paint chips you never saw before that you're going to see. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, it kind of helps out the technician. They go to these TSBs or technical service bulletins. It gives them an idea. You know, example just may be as simple as, you know, an evaporative emissions problem and they move the canister over. But there's also brake pad issues like you know the car may have an inherent, inherent squeal in the brakes because of the metallic in the pads there's so much metal in the pads that they squeak so the manufacturer put an upgraded part number mm -hmm. and you the consumers we don't know that so we just go to the parts house and we just get these regular old pads and put the regular old pads on and the squeal's still there so we don't fix it they actually might have manufactured a more organic pad with less metal in there that stopped the actual squeal because the car was inherently squealing brakes in the morning. Mm -hmm. So without that part number or that TSB or technical service bulletin, you just keep throwing parts at it. You're never going to fix it. And sometimes you have to, I mean, sad to say, sometimes you have to get a, a dealer specific part like a gas cap i know a lot of people's gas caps this little thing they're like what is that screw on on my on my dash but it's that's usually the gas cap light it's an evaporative emissions thing they don't want you putting gas fumes into the air and your cars are designed to detect those kind of leaks and you can get an aftermarket one some are some are really good depends on what kind of quality aftermarket parts you get but then others aren't so good and you have to end up going with the manufacturer because they're built to withstand to detect specific pressures now what you guys find inherent problems we we call them pattern failures um everybody if you're driving a, a ford triton you know you got some rocker issues going on with the variable valve timing if you drive a chevrolet truck with a ls motor 
Everybody knows that the camshafts with the displacement on demand, it starts to wear out after time. You get some clicking and you get some ticking. That's why we talked about on podcast one, how important it was to use the correct fluids. That's why, Mm -hmm. because these inherent problems, a lot of times a manufacturer will come up with things that supersede these problems and fix these problems. Dodge is a great car. You worked at Dodge. One of our local dealers is Mm -hmm. phenomenal out there, but there was pattern failures with them as well. What'd you guys find out there with some of the cars? Well, one of the 3.6 liter ended up having a, a leak around the oil cooler on top and basically the only fix for that was to replace the oil cooler because it came with a specific gasket like you said that they had upgraded that's going to fix that issue that's the only way to do it and we also had a tsb one time that the temperature gauge kept fluctuating it would go from hot to cold hot to cold hot to cold so the great technician we are we put a new gauge cluster in it still did it we put a new thermostat in it it still did it Hmm. we put a new hoses we rerouted the water pump still did it Guess what? Technical service bulletin a little bit later when the car come out and they says, hey, the engineer had just put the thermostat too close, the temperature center too close to the thermostat. Every time it opened, it fluctuated the temperature. So they had to go in and actually reprogram the car so the gauge would be delayed so it wouldn't fluctuate as much and it fixed it. But reprogramming it, that's huge. A lot of people today, they do a lot of car fixing with reprogramming that computer, can't they? They can. They can. They can change the tolerances, the specifications that it's looking for, and all kinds of stuff in there. And all, I mean, there's just a ton they can do. Crazy. So, and then you go into actually fixing the car. You look for all these DTCs, diagnostic trouble codes, that check engine light. Man, that takes priority over everything. If you have that diagnostic, that check engine light, you can go get a pocket scanner, man, for $20 today, or you can go down to the auto parts store, they'll scan it. Doesn't mean the part's broken. Please, you guys understand that. Just because you have a check engine light on, it gives you an oxygen sensor. Don't buy two oxygen sensors. It could be the wire harness, it could be the circuit. There's all kinds of problems that go along with that, but that's a good indication, at least a detective clue, strategy-based diagnosis, what's going on, isn't it? That is, absolutely, absolutely. Now, what check engine lights have you seen quite a bit? Any of them? Um, usually it's the one that's, that comes on it's shaped like an engine. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it looks like. I mean, we've seen a lot of what? Evaporative emissions? All right, yeah. Misfires? Holy misfires. Mom. Misfire, I would say, is probably one of the most common ones that comes on. And you don't know it's a misfire until it's pretty significant. Usually when the check engine light comes on, it's a misfire. It's one where the spark plug, it's not, it's not, the cylinder's not firing every once in a while, but eventually, and then you have the check engine light on, you just ignore it. And then one day you're going up a hill or you just start to take off out of the driveway and your car starts making all kinds of vibrations and stuff. It's like, man, what's going on in my car? Oh, I got a check engine light on. Maybe that has something to do with it. Exactly. Strategy-based diagnosis. Once again, at least gives you an idea of what's going on. Perhaps you had a check engine light on for a while and now it doesn't start. Well, maybe that was a camera crank position sensor starting to go bad or starting Mm -hmm. to have a failure and now it just totally conked out. So a crank position sensor won't allow the car to start. So, you know, but if you go scan it, like I said, you get that code, don't run and grab a part. There's a diagnostic flow charts, there's stuff available, there's Google, there's service manuals, there's all kinds of ways to kind of look at some ideas or pending ideas that could be the problem with your car so you can fix it right. Fix it right the first time. That's what this is all about. For the technicians out there, time is money. You said it. They get paid by flat rate. The quicker they do it, the better the repair is, the better off it is. And, you know, especially here, I know in the Tri-County area, we got some phenomenal dealers. They do this, they use this technique, but it can give you guys at home an idea where you're going with it at least. Absolutely. Now, follow this. You don't have to follow it to a T. It goes by experience. We said you verify the repair. Just sure, make sure it's broken. If it's not broken, you can't fix it. You can do some preliminary checks. Try the other systems. We just review real quick. You can check for actually diagnostic system checks in the car, the check engine light. You can check for bulletins or TSB or pattern failures. And you can kind of gather your information up. Yes, you may have to take it to a shop, but you go in there as a more knowledgeable customer. Knowledge is power, especially when it comes to your vehicle. Absolutely. All right. Well, that was another one. Another one in the can, man. The podcast are rolling. We need you guys to watch. We need you to download it. Follow it on all the platforms. We throw it out there on Facebook, on Twitter. Our executive producer and creative genius, E-Dove, he has it in the can, man. Everywhere you guys look for it, you can find it. If not, contact him. He can do anything. So just make sure you download it, get it, support us, watch after us, send Eric some E-Dove. Send them some love. Make sure that uh, you guys are staying with us. So we'll be back with more automotive tech talk and more podcasts. You guys just make sure you stay tuned, download it. We'll see you.